Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support the show by becoming a premium member, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash podcast to sign up. Memberships are only $2.99 a month. By becoming a premium member, you'll be able to download episodes onto your mobile device and listen to them commercial-free wherever you go. Also, if you'd like to check out the new Dogman Encounters t-shirt store, please go to dogmanencounters.com backslash store and take a look around. Buying a t-shirt or sweatshirt there is another great way to help support the show. As always, thanks for listening. Before we start tonight's show, I wanted to share something with you. Some time ago, I promised Brandon that if I ever lost contact with him, because at the time he was concerned that might happen, that I'd bring that to your attention. Well, for whatever reason, I have lost contact with him. I don't know what's going on, don't know what the reason is, but unfortunately, I can't reach him. Hopefully, he's okay. If I do hear back from him, I'll be sure to let you all know. All right, let's start the show. If you listened to episode 207, you'll remember how Brandon came on and told us about several of the recent dogman encounters he's had on his property. Unfortunately, we ran out of time and didn't have enough time for Brandon to be able to tell us about all these recent experiences. With that in mind, the plan was he was supposed to come back on the show last week to tell us about those other experiences, but due to a death in the family, he wasn't able to do that. Now that he's feeling better, he agreed to come back and do the interview for tonight's show to tell us the rest of the story. Brandon, welcome back to the show. Hi, Vic. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, but more importantly, how are you doing? I'm moving forward, thanks to you. I'm glad you're moving forward. Any kind of movement's a good thing. Brandon, as you'll remember, on episode 207, you told us about several of these recent experiences you've been having. But after you told us about the dogman you saw in your basement, we ran out of time. Please tell us what happened next. Well, basically, I came back up and checked on my daughter. She seemed fine. She wasn't awake. I opened the bathroom door and let Maya out. I had already had the basement door shut from the first floor. Maya ran back upstairs, back up into the bedroom. I followed her. My daughter was fine. I get back upstairs. My wife was sitting in a 90-degree angle again, straight up in bed. She said, please don't tell me what I think that was. I walked upstairs and followed my dog. She ran right back up into the bedroom. I got back upstairs, and I saw my wife sitting in a 90-degree angle, straight up in bed. And she said to me, please don't tell me what I think that that was. And I said, it was what you think it was. That was a dog man. And the look on her face was devastating. She said it was in our house, and I said it was in our basement. She started freaking out, asking me a bunch of questions. I said everything's locked, all the cameras are on, everything. So she made me grab my daughter, which I agreed with. I think that was a good idea. I grabbed her, went upstairs. Now, we're in the bed. Maya's at the foot of the bed. I've got my daughter between me. My wife, I'm on the right side, my wife's on the left side, my daughter's in the middle, and my dog's at the foot of the bed. I don't know where my cat is, probably gallivanting around in the house, I have no clue. But it was probably a couple hours that had gone by, and now the storm cellar door is locked, all the cameras are on. My entire family is upstairs, other than my cat, which seems to be completely fearless at this point, or I have no clue where she is. I hear a banging and scratching on the screen that's outside the window. It sounds like somebody is taking a pen, and all the little dots that are inside of the screen, they're dragging this point of this pen across. And then I hear it loud on the window. It sounds like streaking. Like somebody is, is, is scraping something against it, like a dry razor blade or a wet cloth with some type of a cleaning material. And I hear this tapping. And this is maybe three, four hours later. It's almost 4.35 o'clock in the morning. 
and I hear something rustling around outside, but at the same time, I hear something inside. Maya's up. She's already at the foot of the bed. She's looking around. I hear something downstairs. I immediately lock eyes with my wife, and her eyes were so huge. I've been with her for a while, and I have never seen her look at me the way that she's looked at me like that before. I got scared. I could hear my heart beat in my ears. I'm fresh, woke up, out of a dead sleep. My dog's ears are completely perked up, looking out of my door to my bedroom. The light from outside is shining through the window into the door bedroom, and you can see the reflection of it because it's all dark in my bedroom. And as you go outside of that room, you can see light shining in and the reflection from outside, but there's also a darkness from where there's no light. And I look and I can see what I think is it looks like, if anybody knows what Pikachu looks like, the Pokemon. I don't know a better way to explain this. It looks like the top of this Pokemon. I can see two pointy ears with a roundish head underneath. And I'm looking at it right out of when I woke up. And I thought, okay, I'm imagining things. I need to figure this out. My dog is now just sketched out. This needs to stop. I said, Maya, come on. Let's go to bed. Come on. And she wouldn't come to me. So I stared at that. I stared at it. It was about 15 seconds. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at these two ear points on the reflection of the light on my bedroom door that's coming from outside of it. And I see it drop down and disappear. It changes form. There's no more ears. It's all light, which is what I'm used to, being seen off the reflection from the light on my bedroom door through the window from the moon. Something is downstairs. My dog is right next to my door, but she won't go out. She turned around and came back. I grab my pistol again. My wife says, please don't do this again. I don't want to deal with this. Please don't tell me this is what I think that it is again. Please. And I said, sit tight. I'm going to go check it out. I've got a 40 caliber Glock. I walk up to the edge of my bedroom door. There's stairs that go down to the right. And then there's a hallway that goes all the way down. And there's three more bedrooms down there. I look down the stairs. And I can't see anything. All I can see is the shadow from the trees moving left and right, just like I saw the shadow of this what looked like Pokemon ears on my bedroom door. This dog man had come halfway up the stairs, and it had been smelling and sniffing and sitting directly outside of my bedroom door. It's an old house. That's why the dog wouldn't move, because it was so close to me. It's an old house, so when I got up, it made a creaking noise, and I heard, and I heard it go downstairs. As I come around the corner of my bedroom door, my heart is pounding a million miles an hour. I've got my dog, my wife, my daughter in my bedroom. My cat, still, no clue where it is. She's probably the most savage creature in the entire house. She's like the honey badger. I reach around the corner and I start to walk down the stairs. I'm so terrified at this point because I can hear something banging around in my kitchen, which is directly 25 feet at the bottom of the stairs, straight forward. I'm halfway down the 14-step stairwell and I can see the light start shining on my toes. I've got my pistol pointed forward. I can hear me breathing. I can feel my heartbeat in my ears, and I hear this growl, this gurgly, low-tone growl. I knew what was going on, but I knew that there was no way that I was going to continue to deal with this. I'm a grown man. I'm 31 years old. This is my time to deal with this. My family's upstairs. This is it. I can hear this creature in my kitchen. There's no lights on, except light shining through all the windows in my house. I slowly step down the bottom of the stairs. 
creaking. Every creak, I hear this creature stop breathing. Breathing very heavily. Every creak, I hear it stop. I stop. I wait about 45 seconds. I hear it start breathing again. Very heavily, like there's a lot of weight on its chest. That's what I gathered from that noise. I get to the bottom of the stairs and I look forward. I'm able now to bend down and point my pistol through all the way to the kitchen, which the main dining room is between the kitchen, the main dining room, and then where I am, which is the bottom of the stairs. And I look over and at this point, I couldn't smell anything. I couldn't smell that stereotypical dog man smell. So I didn't have that primal fear. I knew there was something in my kitchen. I'm thinking it might be from when I left the door open earlier. Maybe it's a raccoon. Maybe it's a squirrel. I don't know what it is. But my worst fear was that it was a dog man. So I get to the bottom of the stairs and I point this pistol forward. No sooner did I point it forward, I look ahead of me and there he is. There's a dog man in my kitchen. I'm froze. My heart is pounding in my ears. I know that I have the most precious living being upstairs, 30 feet behind me and 10 feet above me right now. My wife, my daughter, and my dog. I need to do something. This needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. I must not have shut this cellar door all the way. I'm looking at this dog, man. I've got a breakfast bar in front of me because that's how my kitchen is made. It's a square breakfast bar. It's a square kitchen. There's a breakfast bar in front of me in between this creature. I see him, and I think I need to unload, and I need to unload right now. So I look forward, and I see it, and I see, again, it's teeth are bright white, and it's hovering. It looks so big in my kitchen, so tall. It looks out of the ordinary. It looks like it doesn't belong, and it's hovering. It's leaning forward. Its arms are hanging forward, and it's bobbing up and down two to three inches, just... (sighs) And I can hear it breathing, but there's a low growl to its breath every time it breathes out. And I see it there, and I don't know what I was thinking. I've never done this before. I took a few shots in my barn, not knowing what was beyond it, but I've never done something like this. And I decided to take a few shots. As soon as I pulled my pistol up, I decided to take a shot, and this thing ended up grabbing around the edge of the counter and I could see its nails on the edge of my counter. It swung around and ended up going back out of my wood room door. I don't know how to handle this. I'm in fear it's going to blow by me, blow upstairs, take my family from me. I'm more worried it's going to take my family than kill them. I would rather have them killed than have them taken because I don't know what's going to happen out there. I can clearly see at this point, this is a male dog man, full genitalia, very large genitalia, extremely large. It swings around in my kitchen. I take two shots, completely miss. I know I didn't hit this. It goes out of my wood room, and it's gone. I'm sitting in the middle of my kitchen. I hear my wife upstairs screaming. The baby's crying. My dog runs downstairs, but she won't go past me. And I was yelling to her, go get him, go get him, go get him. And she wouldn't go get him, and I was getting mad at her. I feel bad now because I was getting upset with her but she wouldn't go get him. I wouldn't go get him. So now I'm in the house sitting by myself downstairs. My family's upstairs. I'm able to protect them. And there's dead silence. There's nothing. 
no chirps of anything, just a complete dead bone silence. I've got my pistol still out in front of me, wondering why I haven't squeezed the trigger. I just, I froze. I feel like I failed. I failed my family. But I didn't need to protect them at that point, because it chose the exit that it chose. The level of intelligence with this creature is immense. I go back upstairs. I explain everything to my wife. She's crying. She's screaming. I am just completely disgusted. We're moving. We're done with this. There's nothing left. We have nothing left. I'm not dealing with this anymore. I'm not calling the police, which we've already discussed. It's not happening. They're not doing anything. I didn't know what to do. I was waiting for this dog man to slowly just crouch down on its haunches and jump up on top of the kitchen counter and just stare at me and growl. But it never did. It ran off. I go back upstairs. I explain everything that's going on. And I tell her. I, I, I don't even have to tell her. She knows. She's crying. And I said, it's going to be okay. Immediately as I run back upstairs, I shut the door behind me. I lock the door and I jump in bed. I lock the other door to my top second floor porch that's outside my bedroom. And I said, no one's getting in here. No one's touching us. No one's hurting us. You're fine. And she said, that's not what it is. She kept repeating. That's not what it is. That's not what it is. And I didn't understand what that meant. But I think what she was trying to say is, that's not what's going on. Because she could hear what was going on downstairs. She could hear the stomps of this dog man going through the house, our house, where we raise our children. She could hear me load my gun, cock my gun. She could hear him run out of the house. I try to calm her down over the next couple of hours and I finally sit down. And we're just about to go to sleep. And I hear more scratching outside. I hear it on one side of the house from downstairs. I open the door and I run out on the porch and I look down real quick and I hear <laughs> something run. I totally run. I didn't know what to do. I knew what it was that was going on. But at the same time, I hear scratching as this creature is running. All I can see is a shadow. I hear scratching on the other side downstairs near my daughter's room. I hear more scratching and more more banging. And it had been almost an hour and a half. It's light, almost light now. It's It's pretty much light. Now I hear these moans and howls and screaming. My wife is going nuts. I'm going nuts, but I'm trying to be her rock, so I'm trying to stay calm. But I know what these noises are. She knows that I know what these noises are, and I know that she knows that I know what these noises are. That's when it really started getting serious. I heard multiple dogmen tapping on the windows, scratching on the windows, running around my house. This dogman went and got more of its family or more of dog men that it knows. And it came back, Vic. It came back. They were surrounding my house. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I sat up in my bedroom with my family, cuddled up. All I can hear was scratching, howling, screaming. And all I can think is that they're going to jump up on this top floor. I've heard of these stories where they've jumped up on the top floor, they've broken through the windows, they've pulled people out of screens, they've waited till they knocked on the door and then came outside, they've been up on top of the roof, Vic, and they've lit people up on top of the roof when they open the door. I stayed in my house. I waited. It started to get halfway through the beginning of the morning, and I didn't know what else to do. I waited and waited and waited. I know that there's a retaliation coming. Since then, we have left. We've been staying at my camp at the Adirondacks. There's been a lot of other issues going on there. We only lasted two days there. Now we're staying at my mother's. And I don't want to stay here long because I don't know what 
type of creatures are going to come and reveal themselves over here. I don't know how far they travel. I don't know how they communicate. I don't know any type of the communication that is involved with these creatures. All I know is that they have completely invaded my house, terrified my family, threatened my family, and I had to do what I had to do to protect them. I had no other choice but to risk what I felt was potentially my future to be able to remain in charge. It's my house. I'm a grown man. I work for it. I was handed this and continued to pay the bills, handed down from family. This is my family's house, not these creatures. I had to move forward. So now we're at my mother's house. We've closed on the house here shortly. We, we will be moving into a different area. And that's what I'm hoping will be quite a change with all of these things because they've had many opportunities and I'm waiting for them to strike again. Brandon, words can't do justice for how sorry I am you had to go through those experiences. That's rough. Did you look for any evidence outside your daughter's window the morning after the night when you caught that dog man looking in on her? After I had seen that, I had actually came out the next morning and looked around. I hadn't seen anything on the ground because two feet away from the edge of my house, there's stone that wraps around the entire house because when I mow the lawn with the zero turn, I want to be able to have clean cuts. And I don't want to have to weed whack. I don't want to have to do any edging. I don't want to have to, I want to minimize the amount of work that needs to be done to be able to maintain the property directly around the house. And it doesn't matter what amount of weight was on there. I wasn't able to find anything at that point that was there other than when I put all the runner crush up against the edge of the house. What you would normally do with runner crush is you would either take a hand tamp or a plate tamp, a gas-powered plate tamp, and kind of vibrate it down or hit it down. There was definitely marks on the outside, eight to nine inches long, that were pressed down further than the other stones. And my daughter's window is probably eight to ten feet above where that area is. So you would have to be on a ladder to be able to see what it was that I saw, which was clearly a dog man, the shoulders, the head, the ears, the mouth, the face, the eyes, looking directly into my daughter's window, almost with a smirk, like he had a plan to harm her, like he had a plan to take her. I saw the marks that were outside there. And although it wasn't like mud where I could directly see a firm print I could see where the stone pressed down more weight than there was on all of the other stones remaining around the house. And that just continued to confirm what it was that I had witnessed the night before. I can only imagine how horrible it must have been to see a dog man looking in an open window at your daughter like that. That is horrible. Absolutely. After having the encounter with that dog man you told us about in episode 190, why did you leave your daughter sleeping on the first floor with a window open when you and your wife were sleeping on the second floor? Well, at that point, Vic, that was just five or six months ago, and it was the middle of the winter time, and the windows were closed. So, after five or six months, the government establishment that had came over and assured me there would be no problems, I didn't believe. But slowly, over one, two, three, four, five, six months later, slowly, very slowly, we let our daughter be brought back down into her bedroom. And we were able to put her in a position to where she would be able to sleep by herself. And we would be a little bit more comfortable with that. We had the video cam right next to our bed so we could see what it was that was going on. We've had months. We'd have half a year to be able to feel better about this, thinking that this is gone, there's no more issues, and there hasn't been any issues. Now it's the middle of the summer, though, so it's hot. I don't want to put an air conditioner in her room because that'll be too cold for her. So I allowed the window to be open. That was my decision. It had been half a year. We haven't had any issues, any encounters. 
And within the month that I did, this is when this issue had been brought about. And I always check before I go to bed. She's okay. She's sound asleep. And then before I actually sleep myself, I look down at the camera. And if any noise happens, any movement, anything, I wake up immediately and look down and I can see the camera facing on her crib. So after all that time, I didn't want this creature to control me or my family anymore. I wanted to give us that freedom of being able to let the window open. It's it's been half a year. I want the window open. I want her to feel okay. My daughter had slept with us for four or five months. If anybody out there has children, you know, one month to four years old, you are not able to sleep with your child in your bed. If you are a parent, you know this. Six months went by. I wanted to put her back down her bed. It was an executive decision that I had made and agreed with my wife. And it was time to do that. No sooner than a few weeks went by, here I was in the situation of this dog man looking through into my daughter's room, ready to take her from me. And I regret it, but I did what I needed to do outside of being able to protect myself. I needed to protect my family first. And that's why the encounter went the way that it did. I wasn't trying to take you to task with that question. It's just that a lot of listeners sent me messages after last week's show wondering why you did that. Absolutely. If anyone's ever had children, as much as they wake up, you can't have them in your bed. As much as they move around, as much as they wake up, You can't have them in your bedroom every single night. Yes, it was a serious issue. That's why I went six months without any issues to be able to ensure that everything was okay. And then with surveillance, I was still skeptical, but it was time. I hadn't slept normal for six months with my daughter in bed, going to work every day, super tired. Because I was up all night with my daughter. So was my wife. So it was time for that to happen. It was six months. It wasn't cold anymore. You know, that was March. February, March. So it was time to give my family a level of security that they would understand. And I felt I could make a statement by agreeing with my wife that it was time to move forward, that she could sleep again by herself with a level of surveillance that we were both able to accommodate in view on a minute-by-minute basis. I see. That's a tough one. Do you regret yelling at it the way you did that night in her bedroom? The night in her bedroom, I didn't have any level of self-control. The only thing that I assumed was that I was going to open the door and it would have already been gone because I was loud coming down the stairs. What I thought was quiet really wasn't quiet. It was pretty loud. My wife had also told me I was not very quiet coming down the stairs. I immediately kicked the door open, pointed my pistol out towards the window because that's where I saw it last on the camera. It disappeared dropped down, and it was gone. The only thing that I could do in those two and a half to three seconds that I viewed this dog man clear as day through my daughter's window was yell, ah, because I was scared. I was scared for my safety, for my daughter's safety, for my family, my wife. And I felt like I dealt with it in the barn if I was able to show it that I wasn't scared of it. It would go. And again, I thought that it did because of that reason. I don't know what it was scared of other than the fact that I had a pistol pointed at it. But I did, and it left. So it worked for me. If it worked for you once, why not try it again? That makes sense. The neighbor who was with you when you had your first encounter shared some interesting news with you recently. What did he tell you? It had been around the time that I was out in the barn It had been a very short-lived experience. He had came down. My wife had told me, Gene called. He's on his way down. He said he needs to speak with you. I said, okay, set him down. I was about to go out and do the hay. 
before I had gotten out to do that, he had kind of came by and he said, listen, we need to talk. He kind of put the message forward, like, we need to talk. I've had another issue. I've had issues around my house. This, this, and this are going on. And he wasn't very detailed with what it was that was happening. So I said, if you want to come down, come on down. I'm going to be doing this. Hey, you can help me with this. I didn't get to discuss too much with him, but that was the night that I had been doing the hay and I had had another encounter and I haven't spoken to Gene since then. All I knew was that he was supposed to be on his way down and he had ended up showing up and I think he had actually left a verbal message with my wife saying this, this, and this is going on. And I remember being upset with him that he had done that because she doesn't need any additional information and detail as to what it is that's going on around the area, let alone that it's going on at my house. And because these happened three nights in a row, these recent encounters, I think it was either directly before it was in the basement or directly before it was in the haymow up in the barn. But I knew that there was something wrong. I knew there was something going on because he had been just taking drastic measures to try to get in contact with me. and we really didn't end up getting a chance to discuss anything. So I know that there was something that was going on. It was before things really, really got serious for me and my family. I think he had tried to warn me that they were back around and they had been doing things at his house. So I'm waiting to hear from him as to what it is that had been going on at his house. And I hope to hear what that is soon. I hope you find out soon, too. It does make you wonder. After Gene shot that dog man you saw six months ago with that 12-gauge and didn't kill it, did he have any reservations about laying in wait for it outside that night on the back deck with just a pistol? I don't think that I was secure enough to be able to go back outside near the kitchen, out on the deck, lean around the back deck, fire at it, fire at it up in the barn, come around the outside of the house and poke my head around from outside onto the deck where I had also seen it. I don't think that I was secure enough to do or to follow through with those actions. I think that as a man, you need to be able to protect your family and to be able to move forward with whatever decision you think at that moment needs to be made. And do you want me to be honest with you to think that I would have been able to do damage to it? No, I don't. I saw what a 12 gauge high brass slug out of a Remington 875 shot pump had done, merely ripped its pectoral muscle off, which was probably five inches thick. Do I think this 40 caliber Glock would have done something to it? No. Unless I shot it in the eye, the mouth? No, I don't. But I think it would have scared it enough to be able to get it away from us. And that's why I had came downstairs with it the way I did, kicked my daughter's door open the way I did, came up on top of the ladder in the last episode and pointed it like I did before it jumped out of the top of the window of the haymow, came outside on the deck when I had heard both of them running around my house multiple, at least two. I didn't know if that was the best move to make. You don't always know the decision that's going to be able to be best for your family. You don't always know what that decision is, especially in a situation where you don't know much about this creature. But I did what I thought I could do was right. If I could look back on it, some people may contradict my opinions, my theories, my movements, my decisions. But until you're actually in that situation and you can say that you got up out of bed, you went downstairs, you went to go fight this creature, knowing what it's capable of, it's entered your house. It's almost taken your daughter through the window. Until you can say that those things have happened, I'm not offended by anybody's opinion. Because everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But until they're in that situation, I I can't really deem their opinion to be valid. It's very difficult to put yourself in the situation that a lot of us have been in and be sitting listening at the other end going, well, what I would have done was this, 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 and this. Well, now you're playing the shoulda, woulda, coulda game. 
because it's very easily to have 2020 hindsight. But when you're in the situation, that's what makes you who you are. And I'm not better than anybody else. I did what any man, any real man, would have done for his family. If anybody comes back saying they would have done this, 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 and this, and it would have turned out better, I hope that it would have. And maybe if I agree with it, maybe I hope I would have done it that way. But you've also had minutes, hours, and days, weeks to think about how you could have dealt with it differently. These are split-second decisions. And you need to make these decisions as quickly as possible. Because if you don't, it's you or them. And it's not going to be me, my family, or anybody in my family. It's not going to be. That's a very difficult question to answer. Because until you're in the situation, you don't know. You absolutely don't know. Yeah, it's all too easy to judge your actions while you're sitting on the couch or in your favorite recliner just listening to you talk about these experiences. Like you said just a bit ago, yeah, try placing yourself in your shoes and see how you do then. So no, I totally agree with you. You said you considered trying to fix your dog man problem with the help of friends. If you would have done that, how would you have gone about trying to do that? I think what I would have done before I had moved is brought as many people over, I think, as I could. I had a lot of different ideas, to be honest with you, but the one that particularly comes to mind is I think I would have as many people that have had personal encounters bring it to social media. I think I would have as many people as I could come over and spend the night and be involved in the situation that I was involved with although I've failed to do that in fear of putting their lives, families, and safety in jeopardy. So it's a difficult choice to make because you want people to understand where you're coming from, and if they've failed to be in a situation where they've been exposed to a dog man, it's a difficult choice to be able to put them back in that position where you know that you were very uncomfortable being in. I think if it would be up to me, I would get as safe as I could, as many trustworthy friends as I could, and we would wait and we would hunt it. But I don't know enough about this animal yet to be able to safely hunt it and be able to put the lives of the people that I truly care about in jeopardy without feeling secure enough to where we would be able to make it out alive. And that's my fear at this point. Yeah, for the life of me, I couldn't tell you how many people it would take to safely try and hunt one of these things. I think it's best, if at all possible, to avoid trying to do that. There's an illustration Chris Chin just created for me that's going to be on the new Rogue Collection Dogman Encounters t-shirts I'm going to be selling soon. How did you feel when I showed it to you last week for the first time? Well, to be honest with you, Vic, it's it's so precise. It's so exact that I had I had to get it off my screen quickly because that was very uncomfortable for me. The accuracy and the skill that this person has to be able to take the insight, knowledge and information from everybody's encounters and put this onto a actual piece of artwork and in, in, in physical form was just phenomenal to me. And I don't think that uh, if anybody else out there can relate, you'll know also that that was something that you couldn't look at for a very long time because just short of an actual photograph, this is 95 to 99% accurate. And it's very disturbing. Oh, it's disturbing. There's no denying that. Much more so than the previous illustrations that Chris has made for me, we spent a lot of time on the phone, sending messages. I wanted Chris to know exactly how the hand should look, how the head should look, the ears, the eyes, the mouth, the teeth. Everything. I wanted this to be meticulously accurate. But having said that, I can't say enough good things about Chris Chin. His talent's amazing. Do you think any of the dog men you encountered two weeks ago could have been the same one you talked about encountering in episode 190? I think 
that's a very valid point. I know that in 190, when I looked over, I saw a male genitalia, extremely large. I know that for a fact, when I had seen him in my house and up in a mouth, it was also a male. But at different times, there was different ways that it was sitting and crouched and standing and jumping and the way that its ears were and the way that its head was tilted. The colors looked familiar. They looked the same. But to try to tell you that I think that it would be the same one, I don't know enough about this animal to be able to make that type of judgment. I mean, I could just jump in and say, absolutely, it was the same one. It's been stalking me. But I don't think that's fair because I, I, I truly don't know. I don't know enough about this creature to be able to make that judgment. So I apologize for that, Vic. Oh, no, that's okay. Yeah, you're under so much duress when you have these encounters. Yeah, no one could blame you for not knowing for sure. So no problem. When you move, do you plan to let potential buyers know about the issues you've been dealing with on that property? I do. I do plan on letting them know that there is some type of an abnormal creature that's been coming up and screwing with livestock, my family, things of that nature. And I've had quite a few phone calls of people calling to check in to see exactly what that means and what the nature of that is. And people ask Bigfoot, aliens, this, that. Nobody really mentions Dogman. I don't think really too many people are familiar with dog, man. And I do try to explain that to them without actually coming forward and saying, this is what this creature is. I let them know that there are abnormally shaped, sized dogs with an extreme amount of intelligence. And at this point, I'm not selling this property because there's so many acres and it's such a beautiful house. I'm merely renting it. So... The people that have called, I've given them correct information. I don't feel that it is the right thing to do to be able to put somebody else's family in jeopardy. I would never want anybody in the situation that my family's been in, and I couldn't imagine putting my worst enemy in that position. That's just not my style, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people listening to this that are familiar with my encounters and familiar with the property. and. They are familiar with the private conversations that we've had, although they may not believe it at the time. If they choose to rent the property out, they will find out. But I'm not held responsible for any type of negative repercussions that happen after that because I have been completely and 100% honest with what it is that's going on there because everyone asks me, why the would you leave this place? So I tell them. And... Basically, I'm in the same situation as I was before the first episode of being made fun of. And, you know, it's a joke. I will not allow somebody with children to rent this property out. I will not allow somebody with elderly people to rent this property out. If you're looking to come through and you're looking to truly build something over here, if it's yourself or yourself and your wife or yourself and your husband, you can come through. And I can guarantee you, you won't even make it a month. And I will completely understand that you need to move and go somewhere else. This is not a tourist attraction. This is not an attempt to be able to continue to make me money. I need to make sure that this is a safe place for people to be without having a continuous issue of people's lives in danger. This is a very difficult position for me to be in. I am judging whether or not people should be in here and risking their lives. I don't want to be held accountable for these dogman encounters. That's not fair for me. I want to be able to move forward. And I don't think that I have the ability and I don't think that I have the knowledge to be able to judge these creatures at this point. So if this is something that someone wants, I will fully explain to them what it is that's going on as I have. Absolutely, Vic. I'm glad you're not going to keep it a secret. You're a good man for warning potential renters. Do you and your wife know where you're going to move yet? Well, at this point, we're about to close on a house in Oswego, New York. We have a rental property in Cato Meridian. And at this point, we're staying basically with my mother, 
who's in the same area. And we did stay in the Adirondacks for a little while, a couple few days. That didn't work out because of some other issues that I'll speak of on a different point in time. But basically, we're going to be moving out towards Lake Ontario, which is Oswego, New York. And we're hoping to move forward with that in the next few days. And the house will close. And we'll be able to move more inner countryside slash city area where we're hoping that there's going to be less of a chance to have an encounter there. Absolutely. Well, I wish you the best of luck on that. I know you hate to leave the property because of how large and pretty it is, but I know you can't wait to get away from that situation. That's absolutely right. Because at this point, there's no going back. You need to be able to sacrifice certain things for what it is that you truly care about. And at the end of the day, you could be in a jail cell with the people that you truly love and truly care about and have the bare amenities. And that's all that matters. You could live in a mansion, have $10 billion every week to spend, and you could be completely unhappy. So I would rather live in a shack in the middle of a place that I'm not too comfortable with because it's not the country, but I know it's safe for my family. I know that I can grow and have my family grow mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially there. And then we can make the choice when the time is right. But up until then, I'm not looking for any type of financial compensation from the area in Cato that I'm renting out. I don't need it. And I don't feel that it's appropriate to put somebody else in that position. So I'm hoping that this will die out and we can move forward and eventually move back there. But at this point, uh, that's not an option. I, I can't risk this anymore to be able to have one of these creatures looking through the window with the potential to take your children is just not something that I'm interested in. And I'll do anything that I need to do to be able to prevail from this issue. You're a good man for putting your family first the way you are. That's impressive. Have you had any other problems since we recorded the interview for episode 207? At this point, Vic, I have not. We've been on the road a lot. We've been moving a lot of things, leaving a lot of things behind. We now have absolutely no cattle. I sold the last less than half a dozen for an extremely cheap price. You could have probably ended up buying a couple big screen TVs for <laughs> what I sold these cattle for. So it financially didn't put me in a situation where I'd be hurting. But at the same time, I didn't make anything, and I, I just I, I can't go I can't go back to that right now. I, I need to move forward. I need to get through this. My family needs to get through this, and luckily, my children are long enough. And luckily, my children are young enough to not be able to remember this because that is the most important thing to me. I don't want to have repetitive issues with this creature because I have built an extreme level of hatred against this creature and distrust. So hopefully we'll be able to move forward from here. I know it hurts to move the way you are, but you're making the right choice. I'm proud of you for doing that. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Brandon. Before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Well, I would like to say thank you to everybody that's listening. There is a small issue going on with YouTube right now. And some people trying to shut certain things down. I feel there's a higher power that's trying to shut down the voices of people that are trying to spread this knowledge to other people. And I think that everyone needs to remember that this is not just something to use as entertainment. This is something that your mom, grandmother, daughter, son, brother, sister could be going through. And we all support each other. And I think that's very important to remember. And we need to be able to stick by each other. We need to be able to remain teachable, open-minded, and continue to move forward. Because, Vic, honestly, you've built an absolutely beautiful forum to present this type of knowledge with. And you have a lot of supporters. 
And there's also, with a lot of attention, going to be a lot of negative feedback, especially with people that don't want other people to know that this is what's going on. And I just want to let everybody know that we are all capable of our own decisions. The decisions that we make continuously affect other people. Don't make a decision based off of emotion because it's very difficult to think clearly when you're emotionally involved in a situation. Step back out of that situation. Reassess your position and then be able to have a clear thought on what it is you want to do to move forward to be able to maintain this knowledge, to be able to maintain this type of forum that it is that Vic's created time and time and time again. Don't just sit there with your Coca-Cola and your potato chips and think, what a great Friday this is going to be. These are real people's lives. People are actually going through these things. This is just as bad as being in a situation as war. This is war. We don't know what we're dealing with here. I appreciate and everyone appreciates in the Dogman community everything that you're doing, Vic, when it comes to people actually coming forward and being able to give that level of support to other people, even though they may not have had a personal Dogman experience. It's such a huge feeling to have that level of support from them, to have that level of support from you. I hope that everybody continues to move forward, be positive, keep everybody safe, remain open-minded, and remain teachable, because that's what's the most important, is to be able to stay out of our ego and move forward with this, because this needs to be resolved. We can defeat this issue. We can, but we need to continue to work together like we have been. I'm very proud of everybody that's involved in this, especially you, Vic. Thank you very much. Oh, you know, you're welcome. Thank you for all those kind words. I really appreciate what you just said. Well, thanks again so much for coming on and sharing those experiences with us. You know, I really appreciate it. I wish you nothing but the best of luck with your move. And if I can ever help, please do let me know. Thank you very much, Vic. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. You too, bud. Bye. Bye. If you've had a Dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.